स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया गुड मॉर्निंग सो टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस वॉट आर जॉन्स विच ए स्पेसिफिक रेफरेंस टू फिल्म जॉन्स सो एज मोस्ट ऑफ अस हियर नो दैट जॉन्स लिटरली मीन अ कैटेगरी और अ टाइप अ टिपिकल जॉन इज अ कलेक्शन ऑफ इंस्टेंटली रिकग्नाइजेबल स्टाइलिस्टिक फीचर्स इन लिटरेचर फॉर एग्जाम्पल यू हैव I am talking a very broadly now, um, literary genre of poetry or drama or fiction, short story, non-fiction. So these are the broad genres, the broad categories. Uh, you might uh, uh, very often come across uh, you know, courses like uh, uh, course in drama or uh, a course in, um, let's say. Uh, your poetry or fiction a sub category would be a course in american drama or latin american fiction so those are sub genre um, which uh, which form an integral part of a broader category hmm? so it's likewise in cinema also we have genres some of the most recognizable or rather instantly recognizable genres are the western we are basically talking uh, in uh, in the american context the western most uh, uh, so far we have been talking very often about western being an out and out american product american creation or hollywood creation so western and gangster they are the most popular genres of american drama we also have musicals even in our country musicals is a very popular genre we have thriller and then we have spy genre which is a sub genre of a, of a broader category like uh, an action movie uh, we have a uh, martial arts cinema think hong kong cinema the bruce lee jet lee uh, donian kind of cinema so that's martial arts cinema but then we have its variants in every part of the world i mean kill bill was a good example of a martial arts cinema but then kill bill is a specific category uh, is in a cat specific category of its own um, we also have a very popular romantic comedy the popularly called rom com and then we have science fiction we have already done films like blade runner and uh, which was based on uh, do androids dream of electric sheep uh, philip k dick's novel and we have also done the matrix trilogy so uh, those are the popular genres of cinema but then we have many more and we are going to look at how genres are defined and categorized and analyzed and then we will be discussing um, gangster as a popular genre because gangster cinema is uh, uh, of, of course it's a hollywood product but then even in our own country it has become a very important genre of cinema and then we'll see how indian cinema has interpreted and reinterpreted the genre of gangster cinema so uh, genre usually what does it evoke it evokes the look of the characters physical environment and significant objects we are going to read that in detail so what's the look of the character what are the objects how are iconography is formed in genres genres identif identities usually what purpose do they serve uh, this the purpose the basic purpose that they serve is to preserve a film's integrity um in one of my earlier classes shweta was asking and i uh, 
she answered that she rom com happens to be her favorite genre. My response to that was, um, if someone would uh, who is a, f a follower or a or an admirer of romantic comedy as a film genre. Filmmakers usually make a movie uh, to cater to that specific group of audience, but uh, uh, so the way the film is marketed and advertised and projected, it is aimed at a particular group or subgroup of audiences. So, let us assume a movie like Clueless, Alicia Silverstone and um, we had a remake of that in Hindi, Aisha. So, a film, films like uh, Clueless or Aisha, they cater to a particular group, they cater to a niche group. Uh, that is uh, largely, uh, you know, female audience, girls who would be interested in um, maybe, you know, the lighter pursuits of life the devil wears Prada, okay. but then think of another genre like um, the Bone Trilogy or James Bond movies. So, uh, uh, these genres or the, these groups of films, they have their own fan following. So, that is what I mean when I say that genres preserve a film's integrity and identity. Genres cater to a group of audience and people go to a movie expecting something out of it. So, followers of uh, romantic comedies, they go to a movie like uh, uh, The Devil Wears Prada or Clueless expecting something out of it. You, you have a movie like um, The Shop Around the Corner, Lubish's movie, which was uh, remade uh, as you got mail, Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. So, a popular romantic comedy uh, screenplay was by Nora Ephron. Um, so, uh, the, these kinds of uh, films, they have their own following. Okay. So, when you advertise a movie like this is a remake of uh, a very popular romantic comedy of the 40s, the shop around the corner and then uh, the audiences in the 90s, they expect an updated version of the same film. For example, Clueless is advertised as a contemporary updated version of um, Jane Austen's Emma and Aisha uh, is advertised in uh, India as uh, an update, updated version of Emma, yes, but also um, a remake of something like Clueless. So, the audiences that go to watch those movies, they know what to expect and genres rarely fail to uh, live up to the expectation. Sometimes they do, but then that is another story. So, um, genres in other words allow for expectations where certain things can happen and certain things cannot and when certain things happen out of the box, out of the uh, um, out of character in a particular genre, then we get instance of genre bending or genre blending and that is also something we are going to look at today. Um, sub genres, so what are sub genres? I was just talking about courtroom drama as a sub category of uh, um, a drama. Hmm? So, what is a sub genre? Uh, think a film like uh, 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 the James Dwan trilogy. Now, what is it? It is a sub genre of uh, espionage thriller movie, but then again the broad genre would always remain action adventure genre and a detective or thriller genre or, a espion, uh, or an espionage becomes a sub genre category. Okay. So, sub genre we were talking about, sub genre is defined by specific characteristics. For example, um, you know, you have a very popular category horror cinema. Now, horror has been interpreted in several countries in, se in different ways. So, psycho is generally characterized 
as a horror film. We also have a sub-genre of vampire films. Vampire films. And then another sub-genre becomes a slasher film. So, I know what you did last summer, I still know what you did last summer. So, those films become a sub-genre of the broad category horror cinema. Now, they as we were talking about genres cater to a particular audience and when you have a horror perhaps yes, it is catering to a particular group of audience, but when you have slasher cinema or J horror, then the niche group gets more visible, more defined, more redefined. Okay. So, you know that perhaps you are targeting an age group which is between 16 and 25. Okay. And th those, are the, uh, those are the age groups that generally enjoy J horror and slasher films. We have post apocalyptic cinema which is a sub genre of science fiction. A movie like The Road, which was based on Comic McCarthy's novel, is uh, you can categorize it as a sub-genre of science, science fiction. Um, Noah, we have al already discussed Noah at length in one of our earlier classes. Noah is a category of gangster cinema and we will see how Noah becomes a category of gangster cinema and why it happened. We have already discussed Hayes Code to some extent. We have a sports films like Our Own Chak De India was a very popular sports film. Sports films in India unfortunately are not very popular, not very common, but Chak De in India happened to be an exception because uh, perhaps because of the presence of a star. Okay, so, sports films are a very good, good example uh, or uh, of sub-genre of drama category because there is a lot of drama, there is a lot of action as well as dialogue and high conflict, a strong characterization. These are the features we discussed in our one of our earlier classes. What are, what's, what, how are movies made? So, we talked about a strong narrative plot, then we talked about characterization and conflict. Conflict creates a high drama in most sport movies. Moneyball, yeah, Brad Pitt's. That, uh, so, that is a very popular and successful example of a sport film and it is a drama. Um, Any Given Sunday, Oliver Stone's, okay, it is one of the most inspirational films of all time that is a, a, a subcategory of drama. Then we also have courtroom dramas, uh, another subgenre of drama. The Lincoln Law Lawyer, I think Matthew McConaughey is a very popular to kill a um, Mockingbird starring Gregory Peck, which won him his only Academy Award. Um, to an extent, even a movie like Scent of a Woman, which ends um, in almost like jury like setting, where the boy is on trial, he is about to be expelled, and then Colonel Frank Slade comes and defends him. So, those kinds of Scent of a Woman is a very good example of a typical drama. It has lots of drama, a lot of conflict. It is also a coming of age kind of film, especially for the boy. And it is a journey which these two men take and how they evolve over a period of weekend. Um, theoretically, a lot of work has been done. There is, has been a theoretician, Dudley Andrews, whose uh, theories we are going to consider. But then, a very recent book comes from uh, someone called Rick Altman, who has written a book, film slash genre. It is not slasher film, but it is a film genre. So, what does he say? The gist of the book is that the genre film uses the same material over and again, and it is not, uh, it's not said in a, in a derisive way. It is a very positive statement about genre films, same material over and again. Yeah, I do not know if you remember those two words that we did in one of our earlier classes, the concepts of fabula and sujet. Fabula is a story, 
Fuge is the way a story is told. So, his fabula is a story. Once upon a time, something happened. Okay, once upon a time in America, Sergio Leone's film is a gangster film. Yeah, but uh, and it uses the same material over and uh, again. Have you watched the movie Sandeep? In America, not the, once upon a time in West. You have watched. Yeah. So, once upon a time in America is a supreme example of. Uh, a highly successful um, gangster movie, but it does not, uh, it has all the tropes, it has all the characteristics, the basic raw material is present of a gangster movie, but then the sujet, the way the movie unfolds is something very different. Then it does not follow the godfather trajectory, but the godfather is a very classic linear kind of plot. It has identifiable characters, it has conflict, the kind of conflict where we root for the so called anti hero in spite of his weaknesses, in spite of his fatal flaws. We ro still root for Don Corleone, we still root for Michael Corleone in spite of their very obvious mm, flaws. Once upon a time in America turns takes all the tropes of a genre, uh, of a gangster movie and then turn them over their head. What does it do? We do not have first, the first rule that he violates, Sergio Leone di directed the movie and the first rule he violates is of a linear plot. So, the plot is anything but linear, it follows back and forth in time and very uh, non-linear narrative. The first 15 minutes are absolutely silent, it is and extremely violent. Then second element of plot is conflict. Yes, there is plenty of conflict and we have lots of violence, lots of bloodshed on screen, but it is not the no, uh, normal good versus evil. These people kill out of greed and uh, in the quest for uh, power and ambition. So, again the, this, uh, this kind of narrative departs from the feel, essentially feel good element of, of the godfather. After all, no civilians are ever killed in the godfather. Yeah. But once upon a time in America, friends kill friends, brothers betray brothers, because uh, just for power, and we are not talking about vendettas for naked greed and ambition that crimes are committed here. Then we have characters. A movie like The Godfather has very relate, relatable, very identifiable characters in spite of their essential flaws. However, in Once Upon a Time, we do not have a single sympathetic character. Is, and we are talking about um, the presence of a star of the stature of Robert De Niro, okay, but uh, there is hardly a point when we root for the hero or when we relate to the hero, because he is created uh, in such unsympathetic tones. Okay, so, what is happening? Now, using the same material, yes, but it is the way the story is told, so it is all in the hands of a filmmaker what he does with his material. So, yes, it is a genre, it is a recognizable genre, a gangster genre, it fulfills your expectations, but then it is the, it's the treatment that differs in once upon a time in America and it prevents it from becoming a clone of the godfather. So, that is the difference. Now, uh, Rick Altman also suggests that genres are of repetitive nature. Yes. We know, and then uh, repetitive nature seems to diminish the importance of each film's ending, along with cause and effect sequences. Now, what does it mean that diminishes the importance of each film's ending? You know what Altman is trying to tell us is that genre films depend on the cumulative effect of the film's often repeated situations, themes, and icons. 
So, these are the takeaway. John films depend on the cumulative effect of the films often repeated situations, themes and icons and uh, you know for example, we can take example like in gangster movies invariably we never find the hero walking away in the sunset, okay, the way we find in a western. There is a also you know western is also kind of a genre and there, there we know that the western hero will never settle down he has to ride away, he has to restore balance or equilibrium in a society which has been disrupted because of um, some evil character. So, the hero walks in, restores and leaves. So, that is because there is some other town waiting to be rescued, that is the idea. So, uh, endings are often repeated, that is what we mean when he says genre films depend on the cumulative effect of the films repeated situations. So, we know this is what is going to happen in a typical western, this is what is going to, this is how a typical, typical gangster is going to end. So, gangster hero how he dies on screen, James Cagney in, we are talking about the 30s public enemies, then Edward Robinson in Little Caesar, Paul Muni in 1930s Scarface. So, they have to die in the end, okay. uh, they no hope or no life of promise and roses and wine uh, ending for the gangster hero. So, what, what we are trying, to, what Rick Altman is trying to suggest is that gangster, uh, the, that genres prevent that element of surprise, right. Can you think of more examples, Sandeep? For the hero dying. Yes, is there any gangster movie where you have seen? The hero not dying. Uh, recently, in Ben Affleck's The Town. Okay. He kind of the, at the end of the movie he escapes and uh, police can't catch him. Mm. And uh, in a way, even the Goodfellas is. In a way, yeah, but the uh, Goodfellas is quite different in the sense that it's a life on the run. He will never find peace. It's a life worse than death. Okay where he lives a life which is, uh, he knows that uh, the sum total of his life has come to nothing. Okay. He lives uh, in a kind of a uh, witness protection program and uh, is always threatened, always lives under the looming shadow of uh, threat. So, uh, it is it's a very inglorious kind of an end for that hero, really or the character. Okay. So, he is not um, from where he started and the way he ended. So, it almost end, ends with a whimper, not with a bang, the way Scarface ends. Um, think Al Pacino's end in Scarface, uh, 1983. I mean, he ends with a bang, right? Have you watched the movie? Yes. So, that is the way gangsters are supposed to die. But um, again, in Once Upon a Time in America, the ending is extremely ambiguous. There are two gangsters there. Uh, one is played by James Woods and of course, the leading man is Robert De Niro. We are left uh, wondering at the end whether the De Niro character is dead or not, or whether he is just, uh, whether he is already dead and dreaming the entire movie. Okay, so, it's a, it ends on a very ambiguous note. Okay, we just find um, a truck um, driving towards him and then it passes him by and then he, lo then he looks on. So, whether the idea that is, is that if his life has been uh, a garbage truck, you know that a truck that collects garbage and takes away. Is that what Sergio Leone is suggesting or whether he has been uh, moved over by that particular garbage truck and is taken away to be disposed, for his body to be disposed. So, you never know how, how it ends, but again it is a very inglorious ending, if he does not die a hero's death. How does Johnny Depp die in public enemies? He shot them. Hmm. 
outside the movie theater. Okay. So, that they have taken from John Dillinger's real life. Hmm. So, genre production is allied with, again I am quoting Rick Altman, John production is allied with decorum, nature science and other standards produced and defended by the sponsoring society. Now, um, uh, the other theoretician that I was referring to, Dudley Andrews, and he has written a book called Concepts in Film Theory. This is how he explains yawns. Yawns are specific networks of formulas which deliver a certified product to a waiting customer. So, that is what we have been talking about. You expect rom romantic comedy, it is a certified product and there is a waiting and willing customer for this kind of film. The other day, uh, I was reading an interview by Ajay Devgan and he has done a remake of uh, an 80s pot boiler, Himmatwala. Hmm. Now, he says that uh, there are very few characters who can pull off a movie like Himmatwala. Him, uh, originally, it starred Jitendra and Sri Devi. It is a regular masala pot boiler and but it was a smash success. It was a huge blockbuster and it is spawned off a series of clones. After that, we would find the same pair enacting the same kinds of dances and the same kinds of, you know, the comic subplot and the same kinds of comic villains. Um, it was like an assembly line production. And now, why go back to that genre of cinema? Why go back to the Himmatwala kind of 30 years down the line, when cinema has progressed so much, when people are making films like Gangs of Vasipur, where a movie which Martin Scorsese has praised. Yeah. And then why do we need a Himmatwala now? Because there is a set of audience willing to lap it up. Okay, the same kind of audience um, which exists for a film like Singam or for a film like um, Dawang or Bodyguard. So, I am not being derisive about the audience. I am saying that uh, there is a certified product which <laughs> is delivered to a waiting and willing consumer and customer. So, every kind of a movie has a set of consumer or customer. The other day we were talking about the end of new Hollywood cinema. Now, um, many people, many great directors of that period have lamented the fact that the movement might have died down and there were so many reasons and we have discussed those reasons. But it was not as if uh, the audiences had rejected the movement. They do b blame the audience for lapping up a movie like Star Wars or um, Close and Encounters of the Third Kind. Yes, so um, Jaws. Yeah. So, perhaps these movies have caused, uh, uh, I think you use the word dumbing down of the audience. Perhaps, perhaps there is an imbecile set of audience <coughs> which will always be there in majority in every society. But that does not necessarily mean that a movie like American Graffiti or American Gigolo uh, yeah, or Days of Heaven would not find its audience. There would always be people who would be there for that kind of cinema also. So, what uh, the uh, how I was trying to connect the whole thing is that the new Hollywood cinema also, the fr those great filmmakers also felt that the movement died down because of their own mismanagement and because of certain falls in the distribution pattern of cinema. There is always a certain audience expecting a certain kind of cinema. You are a young man in your early twenties perhaps. What kind of cinema are you waiting for? At the present I am waiting for that string of summer blockbusters, Man of Steel and those kind of things. Man of Steel, okay, that's Superman. Yeah, because it is produced by Christopher Nolan. So, you will think, you assume that there will be a, an edge to the movie. It is not going to be their um, saccharine sweet Superman kind of story. So, it is not going to be 
a repeat version of what uh, Christopher Reeves was all about, okay. But because it has Christopher Nolan the managing things, so something else would emerge out of it. So, a more dark night kind of Superman. So, perhaps that is your genre of cinema, okay. But were you waiting so eagerly for the Jeremy Harmer version of Bone Identity? Though you may be a fan of the Bone Trilogy. Really, yeah. So, it is a number of things that make a genre and the star presence becomes an integral feature of a genre. So, therefore, Ajay Devgan is right when he says, only few actors can pull off a himmatwala. You see, even for that brand of cinema, you need a certain kind of star presence. Convince big enough, okay, who enjoys that kind of fan following, uh, which ensures a kind of opening for that kind of cinema, which ensures a kind of backing for that kind of cinema. Perhaps Salman Khan can pull that off. But if you look at certain heroes who are known out and out only for um, uh, very arty, very classy kind of cinema, they will never be able to pull off the himmatwala genre of cinema. So, genres deliver a certified product to a certain, yeah, you know much of our pleasure of watching Bone uh, trilogy comes, yes, they are very well made films and they, they um, some of us who have read the original novel, Robert Ludlum's novel, we know what to expect. But then the, uh, the second part and the third part, they deviated from the original plot. But the first plot was quite faithful to the novel and we knew what to expect. And of course, the way that Demon uh, essayed the role. So, much of uh, the film's pleasure came out of that. But when another actor reprises the same role, we feel let down. No one was, but it is the same like you know stardom uh, plays so such an important part in making a genre. Uh, can you imagine any other actor in a Mission Impossible series? You will feel terribly let down, terribly cheated if someone else does. So, genres have to satisfy certain expectations. Genres ensure the production of meaning by regulating the viewer's relation to the images and narratives constructed for them. Jean's construct the proper spectator, their own consumption. So, that is what Jean's construct a kind of spectator and that spectator becomes a willing and regular consumer of that particular uh, product. It is like creating a brand, okay. You have a year, you. So, uh, I am just now at this point going to read you uh, a quotation from uh, this book by D. K. Holm. It is called Essential Quentin Tarantino. And what does, because we have been talking about how genres function, how genres satisfy certain expectations. Genres are like brands and they cater to consumers, yes. So, it is like you know you use a certain quality or brand of toothpaste, you would not go for anything else. So, uh, perhaps the girl next door is not waiting for man of steel, okay. She might be expecting Anna Karenina or the great Gatsby, okay. But someone else here might be expecting or uh, awaiting with bated breath for the next series of uh, uh, sequence of, um, let us say, why is Christopher N Nolan not making the Dark Knight series again? Okay. What happens if someone else starts redoing the uh, franchise? Okay. That is the kind of audience uh, that we have. Now, what does uh, Tarantino say? You know, most movies that win a lot of Oscars, I cannot stand. That is Tarantino talking and then he gives you a list of movie, movies and that is breathtaking, the kind of movies he cannot stand. Sophie's Choice, Ordinary People, Kramer versus Kramer, Gandhi. Okay. So, he says these are the movies that win a lot of 
Oscar Academy Awards and I can't stand them because all that stuff is safe, genreic and coffee table kind of stuff. Now, why do we call genre safe? You know, he says they are genreic stuff. Gandhi is a very safe bit. Don't you agree? Follows all the drops of biotic. Yeah. Yes, it has a very universal theme, individual against society. So is Lincoln. Okay, Lincoln again goes back to Spielberg's tried and tested formula. In spite of his greatness, what is Lincoln? One man against society, a loner against society, a person uh, who uh, you know who has come up against all odds, and that man against society. So the, the sympathy factor for the hero is always there, and that's typical Spielberg. You see, it's all there. Okay, but then again, if you come down, come to a movie which defies genre, like Once Upon a Time in America. What happened to Once Upon a Time in America when it was first released? It was a terrible, terrible resounding flop. Why? All these three things, it defied categories, it defied genres. So, the non-linear plot, uh, absence of a very palatable conflict. Conflict is there, but it is not the kind of conflict we expect the good versus evil kind of conflict, individual versus society kind of conflict that is missing and identifiable characters, those things are just not there. Okay, these people are uh, extremely selfish and uh, uh, the only ambition in their lives is to uh, further their own goals, further their own ambitions. So, therefore, they are not the typical feel good kind of heroes. They are not the kind of heroes who are out to change the society. They are not the Gandhis or the Lincolns. Okay, they do not say, or even Don Corleone. So they do not satisfy any kind of demands. Although the movie, if you watch it today, it has become a classic. It may not figure on Roger Ebert's top hundred list. It may not be a canonized movie, but it is a classic. If you watch it, it has it. Is the kind of movie which has become a cult now, okay. a cult which has all the elements in the right place. I mean, it is a very carefully crafted, magnificently acted movie. You can see lot of attention has been paid to every single detail, it is that kind of movie. Now, um, coming back again to Rick Altman and his uh, film Jean. So, he gives us 10 tendencies of film genres and what are those tenden tendencies. He says that genres have a distinct border and can be firmly identified. A typical genre he talks about has these genres have a distinct border and can be firmly identified. Genre theorists seek to describe the already existing genres. The internal functioning of genre text is consider, considered entirely observable and objectively describable. Internal functioning of genre. Can you think of certain examples, Sandeep? Internal functioning of genres are observable and describable. Okay. How genres, how the discrete items exist. Okay. I will just give you a very good example. How will a typical, typical gangster hero dress up? Okay, suit. Okay, always, even, even if you look at a very popular recent 2009 movie, Public Enemies. Okay. The, you know the black coats as dark as crow's feather, they are all there, the creamy cars. The, they are, so, the iconography is so well established. So, these are observable items, that is what we mean. Right? Internal functioning of genre text is considered 
entirely observable. You can see, ah, you know, they come in those hats and those long, those suits with overcoats, okay, designer all, certain kinds of cars, certain kinds of settings. These tropes can are describable. You know that this is what you expect. Now, will you find the same tropes in a romantic comedy? You will find the g more attention is given to the girl's clothes. Yeah, the boy can be dressed anyhow. I mean, if he is a rich boy or maybe a tycoon kind of a hero, he will be dressed likewise. But the girl is equally important. Okay, so the in uh, plenty of attention is paid to detailing the girl's character. Girl is a very integral part in a romantic comedy. Woman is a girl or woman, but the female character is extremely important in a romantic comedy and th these can be described. So, you know, can you give me some very good examples from a typical romantic comedy? I give you one example, you have got male, sleepless in Seattle. As good as it gets. As good as it gets. Or uh, the, the recent one for which Jennifer Lawrence has won her Academy Award. Silver Lining. Yeah, Silver Lining Playbook. Yeah. So, do you think that's a good example of romantic comedy? Now, do you think enough attention is given to both leading characters? Uh, how to lose a guy in ten days? Hmm? So, uh, 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 both the male and the female leads are given uh, equal importance. And these films, they have a, a standard mise en scene. Okay, what is mise en scene? The way people dress, the soundtrack, uh, the lights, the setting, they are of a certain kind which are observable and describable. So, you have got mail, such a feel good movie, and are you going to find interplay of lights and shadows there in you got mail? Like a Noah? No, but in a typical Noah, typical gangster, yes, you will find. So, instantly recognizable features and characters, that is what we mean, describable. You look at certain mise, kind of mise en scene and you say, ah, this is our a romantic comedy. Uh, you watch a melodrama, the other day we were talking about Douglas Sirk's Written on the Wind, All That Heaven Allows, when we were discussing classic Hollywood. And we said, melodrama, a woman's picture, a melodramatic woman's picture will always have certain kind of mise en scene, which is instantly recognizable. You will have statue of Venus on one end, and a statue of Cupid, a <laughs> little Cupid, marble Cupid in another end. Will you find that in a gangster movie? Cupids and Venuses? No. You will find what is, whatever is latest in the guns or the drugs deal. So, those are the standard observable features. Uh, Rick Altman further says that texts with similar characteristics systematically generate similar readings, similar meanings and similar uses. So, again we are talking about genres and genres are texts with similar characteristics. They generate similar readings similar meanings and similar uses. So, when you talk about a, a, an action genre and a sub genre is a superhero movie okay. and superhero movie can be described and be compared only with another superhero movie. You cannot compare superhero movie with a romantic comedy, right. Unless, but when you make a superhero, the dark knight kind of a superhero movie, then you can compare it with film noir or film or even gangster. Okay, because certain similarities do exist because of the way the uh, the Dark Knight character has been constructed by Nolan, the way he interprets. Okay, so you know that this is a Christopher Nolan. He is an author. He this is the kind of movie he makes. We know his hero. We know his hero who is always morally ambivalent. He has shown us earlier in smaller films, Insomnia, Memento, 
we know that in Christopher Nolan, we, are, we cannot expect a very straight, uh, very feel good kind of a hero, very uh, clean cut hero. When you watch a Christopher Reeves Superman hero, you know that what to expect from him. Okay, so, therefore, so similar characteristics similar systematically generate similar readings, similar meanings. Think of more examples. Similar texts generate similar meanings. Pretty sundresses and all. Hmm? They all have the same ending, similar conflicts. Very good example. You know, I would like to uh, think of two classic romantic comedies of um, the 80s and 90s, Notting Hill and uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral, both starring Hugh Grant. Four Weddings and a Funeral, Hugh Grant and Andy McDowell and Notting Hill, Julia Roberts and Hugh Grant. Okay. And you watch starring the same British actor. Yeah. You have all the characteristics of a very charismatic Hugh Grant, okay, when he was in his um, late 20s, early 30s. So, what kind of a, he was a classic romantic hero in the Cary Grant mold. So, you know what to expect from him. So, you, you um, four weddings and a funeral will always be compared to Notting Hill because similar kind of a movie, similar text, and similar meanings can be derived similar mise-en-scene. Now, she always plays the same character. She plays this uh, modern woman who is too busy for romance and stuff. Mm -hmm. And at the end of all the movies, she finds time for romance. In Knocked Up, 27 Dresses, The Ugly Truth, mm -hmm. the same character she plays. Okay. Yeah. We had a romantic comedy uh, when George Clooney started off his career that was Early, uh, early and mid 90s. Uh, uh, he was a major television actor a, uh, anyway, but then one of his earlier successful movies as a leading man was uh, One Fine Day, Michelle Pfeiffer. And if you, uh, with, if you watch the movie again, it has all the characteristics of a typical romantic comedy, boy meets girl. Here it is a woman, a single uh, mother meets a, a recently divorced father. Okay. So, both of them uh, have a child each and how they interact and uh, the entire movie takes course within a span of a day, one fine day. Yeah, they start off hating each other, at the end of the day they are in love. So, there is a relationship between them. So, we know now, now you understand that certain meanings can be read. I am also now going to talk to you about our own gangster cinema. We have been talking about gangster cinema there, okay, Public Enemies and um, Scarface, uh, and which what a little Caesar and The Godfather, Once Upon a Time in America. So these are classic gangster films. Do we have the category of gangster cinema in our country? We have Satya Company. We have the tr uh, trilogy by Ram Gopal Verma. Satya, Company, Sarkar. Earlier, Amitabh Bachchan played a gangster hero in a couple of blockbusters. What were they? Oh, Shole is not. Shole is a buddy movie. It's a western, curry, and what? Don't come under a Dawn comes under the category. And uh, you just gave me an example. Ben Affleck in the town, he rides away into the sunset. Uh, the way Shah Rukh Khan. Dawn ends. Okay, but Bachchan's dawn ends very differently. The gangster hero dies and his look alike takes his place and his job is to finish off the gang. So, he is actually a good guy. In Shah Rukh's version, the good guy is killed, which this is a suspense which is revealed to us at the end of the movie. Good guy. The, the gangster hero is still alive and then we have the sequel to that movie where the gangster hero uh, commits a heist and again rides away into the sunset with a girl on his arm. Yeah? Dawn 2 is more like a heist movie. 
but uh, the first dawn again starring Shah Rukh and directed by Farhan Akhtar, the same team comes back together in second dawn also. But the first dawn uh, is uh, a literal remake of um, Bachchan's Dawn, which was released in the 70s, which was a feel good gangster drama. But Shah Rukh's Dawn ends very differently. Similar readings were done. Scholars worked on that uh, remake also because it's a very interesting take on uh, the original version. We also have uh, a classic gangster, Diwar, again starring Bachchan, where in which he plays a gangster. We also had, of late, we had a movie, um, Once Upon a Time in Mumbai, our own version of the gangster genre. And what about Agnipath? Wouldn't that call, wouldn't you call that a gangster movie? Bachchan's as well as Rithik Roshan's. Thank you very much.